Um, t- tell me a bit about you, bro. I know who you are because I watch you on Twitch. You're Midnight, the yeah. the gamer. Give me the gamer, the gamer, the dad, the the hero. Uh, the hero of the of the hour. Yeah, no, not really. Um, I'm Midnight, and um, I game, and I've just recently started uh, streaming. Actually, it's a relatively new thing. Um, so I've been doing it for oh, probably four or five months now. Um, just try to work out the algorithm and um, sort of work out what niche kind of works for me uh, and for the audience that I want to create as well. Um, outside of that, I'm uh, well. I'm a dad, so I do a lot of the dad duties. Uh, but it is a very busy lifestyle. It's it's pretty much all systems go very early in the morning, get the kids, get them all dropped off and ready for school and daycare and that sort of stuff and come home and then deal with the dogs and their, their issues because they've got many. <laughs> and um, then from there, we, we, we look to stream and then I do it all over again in the afternoon. So yeah, it's just that's, a, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Two shifts a day of, of being hardcore dad mode. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent, man. Excellent. What kind of games do you like to play? I'm probably more, that's, that's an interesting one because it t- depends on which way the wind is blowing at that point in time and what I'm bored with and what I'm sort of looking to, to sort of get out of my gaming at the time as well. But I always do find myself going back to strategy related games, um, more so than anything else. Um, so a lot of total war content, um, you know, I grew up playing a lot of Starcraft and command and conquer and red alert and all that sort of, um, fun stuff as well. So uh, that that's sort of my go-to. That's my constant that I always find myself going back to. Um, outside of that, anything with a really expansive open world where I can create my ideal fantasy lifestyle and I can go and role play it and live it in that world and they've created an environment where I can do that and live out that fantasy, if that makes sense. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 100%. No, I get, I get you. It's, uh, it's often the case. I find with Twitch streamers, although there's, there's many a kind, so many people say, I'm a variety streamer. And I think, mm-hmm. no, trying to be a variety streamer would actually do my head in because it's, I'll try most games, but there's certain games that just go, no, I'm not interested in playing, um, as well as I'm going to default back to a few basics, whether that's, yeah. as you say, I, I, I like the way you put it, uh, depends which way the wind's going. Sometimes I just want to yeah. play alone. Like I want to play No Man's Sky. I, I need to be isolated. I don't want to talk to anyone. Mm-hmm. And other times it's no. I'm going to play Killing Floor and murder zombies in front of people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's yeah. It's a bit like that. It's um, it's. Hard. I, I would say I would market myself as a variety gamer more so than anything else. But I'm finding now that I'm leaning back more into the into the strategy sides of things, and that seems to be what my audience is enjoying as well. So um, I, I'm happy. I'm happy with that. I'm very happy with that. Very comfortable with it. So. No, yeah, that's something cool, I think man. that I think that I'm good at it. I mean, people watch me, so I must be okay at well, it, right? So you know, people also look at train wrecks, so you know, maybe, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe is that. <laughs> I do often find it's uh, I get the most most engagement when I'm doing terribly because everyone's either being supportive or causing the the crash and burn, so they love it. Uh, yeah. The audience loves to get involved in that one. Starcraft, back in the day, that was on console. I did. Yeah, I played a lot on the, uh, ooh, was it the Super Nintendo or the Nintendo 64? 64 I think it, for StarCraft. I think it was 64, yeah. And we had the expansion uh, Pack packs as thing. well. That, yeah, you had to like, open yeah. the front of the console and like, mm, take it out and slam the other one in. It. And it was red because it. it went faster. What are your other nerdy hobbies and interests, if any? Because I appreciate being a full-time dad and also playing Whoa. on the PC. You might not actually have room. For other nerdy things no yeah look other than doing the washing but i wouldn't say that that's a hobby in any way shape or form um <laughs> I, I i do do i've just recently started and this is with my sort of total war binge uh i've recently started collecting a, a death guard army for warhammer 40k it was something that i did as a as, as a sort of early teenage years I, I sort of experimented a little bit with a 40k but it was far too expensive for you know any standard teenager back in the oh, 1990s 100%. to be able to collect um so that didn't last long but yeah i've just recently started doing that along with the painting involved with it as well uh however i am struggling to find the time to to go back and and to sort of to paint them and all that sort of fun stuff at the moment so uh because it, it's either do something with the family 
or stream uh, and finding the balance between the two of them currently. Um, but yeah, so that there's that. Uh, and I'm always on the lookout for good good board games that I can experience with the family and with the kids so that, you know, we can sit down on a Sunday afternoon and get out my little scythe uh, and just play that for a good couple of hours and have a good laugh at each other. Yeah, no, that's cool. Yeah. And that's important too, right? I, I think most people that are really into video games or any other nerdy hobby, either A, were trying to get away from something and they used it as an escapism, or B, they have so many fond memories of doing it with their friends and family that they love doing it. Except for yeah. Monopoly, because that tears families apart more than Coco. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you ever get into arcades as a kid? Like, uh, I remember it was pretty magic to like, go to a cinema and most cinemas usually have some sort of like arcade attached with all the shooters and you chuck god whatever it was back in the day a dollar in uh yeah we did we we didn't have a huge amount of money growing up and i always viewed the arcades as being sort of an unnecessary expense when i have a console it's like mm-hmm. why would i why would i go into to spend money at a pay place to pay pay to play yeah. when i can i can i can just go and ex- get that experience and probably more of the fantasy that I'm looking for from my own experience at home, if that makes sense. So like they were cool to go there with your mates and, you know, maybe if you're at a party or something like that and, you know, you do the little shooting one if you, if you were lucky enough and your parents actually let you do it. Um, outside of that, um, yeah, not really. Um, but yeah, we did have one attached to the cinema back, back in uh, the country town that I grew up in. So, yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> that comment you made if your parents let you do it. I would completely forgot that people look for the most random shit to blame, like, society's woes on. Like, people are being really violent. Is it guns in the community? No, I'm pretty sure it's rap music. Uh, <laughs> p- people are having a, a terrible time. Do you think it's due to, like, low employment opportunities? No, no, video games. It's going to be video yeah. games are the problem. Yeah, it's, it's 100% video yeah. games. Yeah. People try to ban... Don't get me wrong. They've banned a few video games... And I'm going to enjoy B-rolling this. Um, definitely, some video games have been banned, and you go, "That's that's not unreasonable." Um, one I've forgotten. It's like an over-the-shoulder uh, shooter, and the the story is your family have been kidnapped. You need to record murdering people so this guy can turn them into snuff films and sell them online or whatever. And it's like, oh jeez, yeah, I don't know if uh, I don't know if a 15 year old actually just needs to even kind of dance around that i mean you just play doom right yeah i mean i mean gta has had its uh sort of runnings with the australian government over Mm. the years as well um but i mean that's a perfect segue into rimworld because rimworld was was not available to us here in australia for the better part of a year due to uh, yeah due to all of its drug references because you can grow and sell your your own drugs and everything like that um and i think it was at the point where they the devs actually came in and renamed a lot of it so that it wasn't quite so realistic i mean there's still smoke weed that you can harvest and sell um you sort of experience being that that sort of drug dealer (laughs) in in the game itself and so yeah the australian government didn't like that at all and so it was banned for for sale here uh for about 12 months but yeah I, I can literally buy drug dealer simulator on steam for a couple of bucks and everyone's cool <laughs> with it though. yeah I, I love what i love about RimWorld, um <laughs> is i could describe it to someone like if someone's listening to this and they've never played RimWorld, you know colony management sim where you can do a great deal you can build a farm, farm animals, you'll get raided from time to time, you can grow drugs, manufacture drugs, sell drugs, kidnap people, torture people, harvest organs, different body parts, sell them on the black market, and in your mind you're thinking, what a hardcore game. And then you boot up RimWorld, (laughs) and it's like, no one has arms or legs, we're little dot characters that run around the screen, we have hardcore weapons, but we kind of just like bump into each other. Um, I, I love what people must imagine RimWorld is. I mean, people call it the war crime simulator. <laughs> <laughs> and you go, that's a bit unfair. Then you go, yeah, but I can take people's kidneys and sell them for cash. Yeah, yeah. And then 
Yeah, no. I, and as you were going through that list of things that you can do, I was actually ticking off mentally in my head of all the things that I've done in RimWorld. And they are very much all those things, you know. And even when you finish with something, you're like, ah, it's a garbage porn. I'll just harvest his heart and then that's it. Yeah, like a, <laughs> he, a, a he's transport. done. <laughs> There's no morality. There's no overarching morality. You get the notification, transport pod crashed. You might be able to save them. And the first thing no. you do is look at them. Are they of any use to me? Yeah, no, they're yeah. Not. What, Let them die, and then I'll cut them up and eat them. That's yeah, what I'm what, do. what what value do you have to my community? But you know, RimWorld's such a funny game. You know, it's had so much controversy here in Australia, and it, for the longest time, I I really dismissed it as a game that I would be interested in because of its pixelated um, sort of art style that it has. It's sort of two D uh, thing, and, I, and for a long time, I was very much, a, I guess, a graphics snob. Um, and, and really dismissed the game. And I think I came in pretty late. I, I sort of came into it at about 2020, to be honest with you. Uh, so I came in really late and there was maybe one or two DLCs. Uh, and as soon as I played it, man, I was I was done. I, w- I was hooked. I, I knew that this was a game that I was just going to drop five, six, 6,000 hours in quite easily. Uh, and, and look, I'm probably about 1,000 hours deep now and I would say I'm still a noob. Uh, when when it comes to room world management and optimizing it, so yeah, no, I remember. As you say, graphics snob because you're worried about you're worried about wasting your money, I think, and having a bad game. And so when you browse games these days, like no longer is it a catalog or even even a shelf on a wall. Um, it, it's you're in something like Steam or whatever, and you've just got thousands of games available, and you go little circle people that kind of bump and run into each other and i remember i looked at it multiple times and i'm looking at the the advertisements for the game and thinking why the fuck does this just have such incredible reviews i Mm. i can't reconcile the reviews with what i'm seeing and then i picked up the game and i had to i I died instantly maybe three or four times and had to youtube how the fuck do i grow plants so my guys don't (laughs) die instantly like the basic mechanics i don't understand I mean, the modding community, the mod, it's mixed, mixed feelings on that. I love the fact people have the opportunity to get involved and to make some really creative changes is, is really, really awesome. I don't like the fact that some games now are coming out early access, so it's not finished, but I want you to give me money for it. I'm pretending to be really supportive of the modding community, but I'm using that as an excuse not to flesh out my game. The one thing I do like about RimWorld is they do keep putting out DLCs, and our people are going to crack the sads, you know, rage in the comments. They don't do certain updates because they're expecting the modder community to do it. But I feel like the RimWorld guys do a do a decent job. Um, there's mods I used to get that I don't need to get anymore because RimWorld added in versions of that into their DLCs when they launched them, which I appreciate. I think the modding community with RimWorld is is really really strong, and it, for the for the most part, I only just recently brought the DLCs for RimWorld. And I don't recommend that anybody do this. Don't buy all the DLCs <laughs> and install them at the same time. It is a recipe That'd for... Be too much. Oh, it's it's an utter disaster. You, you're trying to learn too many mechanics. So just uh, just 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 drip feed it. Just put one in at a time. Um, but what I'm getting at is for the, for the large time, I didn't feel the need to buy any of the DLCs because the modding community in that game was so strong. And there's so much quality there. I mean, RimWorld of Magic, shout out to that mod. It is amazing and and takes the base game experience. If you can just afford the base game, uh, just download RimWorld of Magic and have fun. You, you, you've got five, 600 hours plus worth of gameplay just in that single download, which is completely free to do. Um, but you obviously support the people that, that make the mod and give them a thumbs up and a recommendation through the Steam Workshop. But um, yeah, it's it's fantastic. Yeah, it, it does suck a little bit with mods though when some they do come out and update a game, it breaks the entire mod list and catalog that you have and you're sort of like, ah, oh, shit, I don't know if the mod author is uh, even still around or active in the community anymore to update this mod and I really like it. So there's there's the sort of the good and the bad with it, but uh, for the most part, I've, I've had pretty good experiences. I'm on a, a little bit of a breakup with RimWorld at the moment because we, um, we lost our our settlement uh, in, in in quite a traumatic set of events. Um, rip um, Knotwood. It was called Knotwood. This is Knotwood, apparently. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, we, we're, we're having some downtime just while we move on 
from from that because I, I think I dropped about five or six days worth of um, investment in this one colony and um, yeah, for it to all blow up in in a matter of uh, you know what was real time twenty minutes, uh, game time twelve hours was that uh, was was pretty traumatic. Yeah, <laughs> I, I do love that. Um, for those who don't know, when you start a new game in RimWorld, you've got a couple of AI options, and that determines kind of how crazy or not crazy the game will be as you play um and i think the, the developers have described the game as a story generator that you can take your experiences in rimworld and actually use them to tell someone about it which again mm. i think falls back to that what i hear about rimworld versus what i see about rimworld are really different um how did your colony die tell me you guys are about to fuck around and fuck oh shit okay so we were f we had a few mechanators uh, in the colony, uh, and they're people who can control little bots that uh, go around your colony. And you can either have some which are defending the colony, or they might be doing some some work for you, whether that be cleaning, whether it be agriculture, uh, or even just moving stuff around the map for you. It just takes the the hands off. Uh, and we were upgrading our two um, uh, mech related people who control these little bots. Uh, and we had to farm a certain material, which was only done through calling down uh, a set of bots. And um, we called down the last raid, as you would refer to it. And unfortunately, the raid was just a little bit bigger than what I had anticipated. Uh, now, we won the fight. It was it was no big deal. Um, and and um, we ended up getting the materials. But our, some of our best soldier-related uh, colonists were left with a couple of wounds, which they were recovering from. So I was like, ah, okay, no worries. Um, so that was all good and fine. We got the materials that we needed. And immediately afterwards, we had a nearby um, bot-related um, event pop up where they were had, had a bot colony close to my settlement in, in the larger map. And they were actually ha had like a, an EMP generator there, which was disabling the entirety of the electronics in my base. It's like, okay, all right, no worries. We can deal with this. We can deal with this. So I, I managed to get together a caravan to send off to go and deal with this threat um, because we can't recover properly. We can't do anything. We can't, can't cook. We can't do anything without our electricity. So we needed it done pretty snappy. And I swear to you, my pawns just dilly dallied around the caravan uh for the better part of in-game six hours before they, they wouldn't even leave the map I, I couldn't convince them to go i don't know what they were doing and next minute they were tired they wanted to go to bed and i was like oh for crying out loud we need to take care of this emp anyway so they're they're all in bed they're all asleep trying to still waiting for this caravan to go and then it happened the largest raid I have ever seen mm -hmm. in my life. Uh, and it was all related to the most recent DLC. But the entirety of the right-hand side of the map was littered with enemy pawns. My best fighters are out. I have an EMP generator disabling all electronics, which includes my defense systems around the colony. And so what happened, I, I didn't realize that the raid was as big as what it was. So we were out there, we're using our sniper rifles, we're plinking them down, thinking, oh, it'll be fine, no worries. I'll just, worst case scenario, I'll get my, my sick and injured out of bed. They can come and they can use their uh, machine guns to mow them down. It'll be fine, no worries. It wasn't fine. It, it was not fine. Didn't, didn't work the, out. No, the, the sheer number of enemy pawns that just flooded into the base it w there was no surviving that it, it um yeah yeah it was it was bad it's 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 bringing it's back memories rim. now it that's and it's that is life on the rim for you because it's not the first incident that will kill you it's the thousandth one and it's normally an accumulation of events that will will bring down your colony and even some of the most well thought out defenses the game will go oh you've done this thing well, we're going to throw this thing at you just to see how you handle the scenario. And so you've always got to have a backup uh, or, or some kind of plan B. But every experience I have in the rim teaches me something new. And I, I take those learnings and try to implement them again in a, a new scenario um, so that... I, you know, it doesn't happen again. Unfortunately, that set of events, I, I, I think that that was quite unique 
um, and possibly the worst thing that could have possibly have happened. Um, but yeah, yeah, that that wraps up not wood. Um, and so the next place we'll record definitely wood, I think. Um, yeah. Stronger name, yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Uh, and we'll just make everything out of wood, and and what will happen is there'll be a fire, and everything will catch on fire, and mm. yeah, mm. yep. yep. That's. Uh, I think the most horrendous death I had was actually recently. Some deaths you just go, oh, this is shit. I don't feel like playing Rimworld anymore, and you pretend it's because you played too much Rimworld. It's because you're having a sook because you weren't expecting to die so easily. Because it's like, well, <laughs> I had a bunch of horses I was going to trade, and they got hit by a meteorite made of pure silver. Now I'm just angry. Um, but I had my uh, playing through the anomaly content, which um, for those who don't know, it's it's horror. A mix-up of kind of Lovecraft and Event Horizon. It's just horror monsters and shamblers and kind of folklore, a lot of demons. Um, I think Stranger Things, and I think you've got a fairly good wrap on the, the latest yeah. DLC. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a big one, yeah. We've been fighting off the horrors, we've been catching the horrors, we hadn't starved to death. Um, and then suddenly uh, a metallic horror, I think they are, burst out the chest of one of my colonists but of course you get the little bit of lore that comes with it all uh, and it says this person was infected by a metallic parasite when they were fighting one of these horrors and it manipulates their movements so they infected their husband while they were sleeping together someone they had been performing surgery on recently when they were injured so I've got three of these horrors have burst out who just down my best fighters because they were inside my best fighters at the time murder through everybody else systematically go and destroy all of my livestock oh, um, Jesus. then the man in black turns up who for those who don't know when you're having almost near death experiences for your colony a, a man in black will turn up and sort of help out but usually by the time you're getting rolled late game he doesn't stand a chance um, he turned up and he managed to get my vampire back into bed but he can't do the caring tool, so her infant baby, he can't pick her up and put her on her mother for feeding. Um, so she's upset. The mother's still having death rest because she's a vampire. She's getting more and more stressed because the baby's crying and starving. Then the metallic horrors, who I couldn't kill, they were just outside and gone dormant. They wake up again because traders turn up and lead them all back into my base. Just in time for my vampire to wake up to see her baby starve to death before she gets horribly murdered. And that's the kind of game that makes you go, holy shit, but they're just little circles that wander around the map with, like, dumb pixel pictures of trees. Yeah. It's a horrendous yeah. game. Uh, it's <clears throat> it's evil. It's it's It, it can be. It's very <laughs> addictive, and um, you get so attached to your pawns. And, and to this day, I haven't completed a single campaign. It's, uh, it's horrendous. If you ever make this game with, like, high-end graphics, like, it'll be the most horrendous game ever made. It'll be absolutely oh. traumatic. Yeah. Speaking of yeah. horrendous and traumatic games, you're a fan of the Fallout series, I understand. I am. I am. Big, <laughs> big, big fan of the Fallout game. And it comes back to, you know, if I can create a fantasy where I live in, um, you know, what would that look like? Um, and Fallout is, is very fond to me because... Um, it's, it's what got me back into gaming. Um, you know, for the largest time as a child, I was, I was a huge gamer. And then you sort of hit your late teens, your early 20s, and you're like, oh, I'm not going to game anymore. It's fine. So I gave it all up. Uh, and then I experienced Fallout 3. And that was it. I was a gamer for life. I was done. Um, and it, it was right when sort of guides were maybe in the early uh, inception. I think that was around that Fallout 3-ish sort of era, so your 2007-ish, 2008-ish sort of time. Um, and, you know, just the ability to, to be this lone survivor and just wander into these places and explore this, you know, at the time, enormous map um, and, and uncover all these different stories which had real choice and consequences associated with them, um, uh, it, it, it just, it just drew me in and that was it. I, I you know, I, I dropped maybe a thousand hours in, into, into just Fallout 3. So, um, you know, and, and then that from there, we, we obviously had Fallout New Vegas, which was maybe what, 2010, 2011, um, which is arguably, you know, a lot of people will say the best, uh, of, of the Fallout series, um, 
Yeah, it's hard between Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas. You know, I have fond memories of both. I don't play it as much now as what I used to. I, I find I've moved on from it a little bit. Uh, I've sort of moved on from a lot of Bethesda games recently, to be honest with you. And they're just not hitting the same spot as what they used to. So, mm, yeah. Mm. I think it's a, a, it's nostalgic and lovely, but a bit of a shame creatively, both in games and even television these days, where there's a real theme of, we're remaking a game. Like, it's nostalgic and lovely that they remade Diablo 2. But why the fuck didn't they just make a better Diablo 4? Yeah. <laughs> it would have been a lot easier, right? Right? Like, yeah. come on. There was, I, having just picked up Diablo 1 again recently, I'm like, that, yes, it's it's clunky. Yes, there's things you would improve. But if someone said, here's my early access version of a hack and slash, I'd go, yeah, you've got it going on. There's things you need to add. But at its core, this is a really, really solid game. Mm. And then they kind of improved. I think they hit the height and said Diablo 3. And then Diablo 4 were like, yeah, those things that really were just a moment on there. No, we're going to get rid of those things. Don't worry. It's yeah. really pretty, though. And it's like, fuck it. Come on, guys. Mm. What are you going to do? Look, Re-release think... Fallout 2 because Starfield was terrible? <laughs> I, look, I got a lot of enjoyment out of Starfield. I don't think it was that bad. I think just technically they left a lot to be desired in, mm. in, in Starfield, especially if you're an NVIDIA um, graphics um, owner like you know 99 percent or 98 percent of the population of pc gaming is um it definitely left something to be desired there but um look coming back to to diablo i do believe they're fixing a lot of the problems that players had with diablo 4 with the season 4 um just recently was watching some news in that and it looks like uh they're they're going full circle with with a lot of the changes that they've made and trying to uh, implement a lot of, you know, player suggestions and that sort of stuff. So it looks like they're making some level uh, of effort to try and fix the game. So cool. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. Well, that's uh, well, we'll need to pick it up again and have another look. I'm on yeah. you with, I don't hate Starfield either. I can just clearly see where they could have done more. When you look at Bethesda, like it's Bethesda. I, you can, I remember playing Morrowind, Elder Scrolls 3. You can pick up... like Every video game had bookshelves with books on them. You could see them. In Morrowind, you could pick them up and read them. Big on Skyrim, but I never experienced Morrowind. Yeah. Okay. Well, in uh, you'll notice in Skyrim, they the Dark Elves will scream, Lord Nerevar, protect me. Well, in Morrowind, you are Lord Nerevar. You, you become the Nerevarine. Ah. And they, they carry on about each other, um, which, is, which is cool. And even in Skyrim, when you make it to... I probably won't put this in the podcast. Might be too nerdy, even for a nerdy podcast. Uh, when you make <laughs> it to Alduin's Wall, um, which is one of the main story quests, it's a big fucking wall with like a story written out over it. It's actually the yeah. story of all the Elder Scrolls games. How you've got oh. like the great simulacrum of whatever Jaeger Than from I think it's the first Elder Scrolls game. Um, like the whole thing, they they tie it all together. Yeah. Um, or when you're in Skyrim and you find cinderin's apprentice and you go to the underground dwarven area and there's a lot of mushrooms and things and there's a quest to go there if you didn't find it just by wandering around yeah um, yep. and he talks about the nern route and that sort of thing well the, yeah, the yeah, person yeah. he's talking about is someone you do a quest for in oblivion the previous game and how they, yeah, they right. link that all in together with the storytelling and like how in in fallout 4 you find the survival's handbooks they're like a uh, a collectible item, but in Fallout yep. Three, you make them with the uh, the woman who runs the shop, I think, in Megaton. Oh, uh, yeah, you it, do it's, too. Like, it's the tuto- yep. tutorial of go to the supermarket, find the food, so people know how to scavenge food, and they're a collectible in the next game. If I remember correctly, she ends up being a ghoul by the end of the game. Whoa, 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 whoa! Only if you blow up <laughs> Megaton. You have to oh, do yeah. the, the evil alignment quest if you're just a nice guy. She's fine. Okay. Well, I... <laughs> you obviously blew I, up Megaton and killed all those people. I, right. I I blew up Megaton a lot of times, yeah. 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 Mm. That's, well, that's fine. Well, that's well that, that sort of thing is one of my issues with, with Starfield, which they may very well fix, but you've got good and bad moral decisions to make. Yeah. And the game doesn't care which ones you make. There's no impact. No. That's right. That's right. and so there's no incentive for really trying to make different playthroughs, and it, which is annoying because the game has a really good um, 
sort of loop that brings you into New Game Plus. And mm. It's in y- the story, just... which is great. I don't know any other yeah. game that's actually made the New Game Plus option a part of the story. I thought exactly. Very exactly. But then there's no real incentive to go and play through the game again because you realise very quickly, sort of a quarter of the way into your, a sec- your second run, that you go, well, everything I'm doing is not really having any real consequence on the game world and environment that I'm living in. So what's the point? Um, and look, I, I believe that they're probably going to wait for the modders to come out and fix a lot of these issues for them, um, which is, you know, a lot of they've been doing that since Fallout 4, which is a bit disappointing, but um, that's probably where it's going to go. But I think um, coming back to Starfield, and we've sort of ventured off here a little bit from from Fallout, but, you know, it's it's relevant because it's a relevant game. When you're making a game which is so sci-fi orientated, you need to market it so that it's actually going to compete with its largest competitors. I feel like Starfield, as its base game as it stands right now, it's, it's not competitive against the other players in the field. You know, you've got No Man's Sky, you've got Elite Dangerous, uh, and you've got Star Citizen, which are you sort of really... Um, big hitting sci-fi um, flying simulator sort of games. And they they didn't really hit any one of those uh, three marks in my opinion. So that's where I think the game sort of falls down a little bit. The ship building I, I think is good, um, but that's about it, yeah. Well, they missed out. It's called Starfield. You've got hundreds and hundreds of planets to explore, but you don't fly around in space. Yeah. You, you fly around in high orbit amongst planets, which isn't a terrible mechanic on its own. It's, it's actually okay, and it, and it sort of works out, but it's not what anyone expects from that kind of game. But you don't travel sort of throughout the void of space in a sci-fi world where there should be... I, I get it, there's a lot of space in space. You can actually like fly forever and never bump into anything, but you'd expect to come across sort of hidden things. Even um, like Freelancer back in the day... Even they go, yeah, it's space, it's vast, and there's a lot of space, but we're putting things in it because this civilization lives in space and has done for mm. a long time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and look, they might have just thought that it would be boring traveling from point A to point B, but that is what people want from a space game, is is they want all of it um, and, and not just the, the little pockets that you sort of found yourself loaded into uh, in Starfield, so... Yeah. yeah, if someone bought a space game and then complained that travelling distances were too long, the response is, <laughs> what the fuck did you expect? It's what did a you space expect? Game. Exactly. You know, we've, exactly. We've given you fictional faster-than-light travel. What more do you want? Mm. And then that's, that's interesting. That's a good segue to go back into the lore of RimWorld, really, isn't it? Because that is sort of what it is uh, is surrounded on. So it's in the title. You, you've landed in the Rim. You've landed in the in the outer regions of civilized space, uh, and whilst there are colonies that are sort of closer in, uh, which are a lot closer together, maybe one or two light years, where you've landed, uh, you've landed on a, on a uh, terraformed planet, um, which is what the bots are there for. We sent them out ahead of time to terraform the planets for us, um, and but you've landed on a planet which is quite possibly a hundred light years. Uh, away from its closest neighbour, and and there's really no uh, communication or trade off planet for you. Period, uh, and you're really isolated um, to make the best moral decisions that uh, you can uh, in that particular scenario. So, yeah, that's I didn't know that. I didn't know that was a, the background law, which makes sense because you you turn up and there's like old bits of robots and and shit yeah. lying around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. I, I think the 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 storyline goes that we left uh, the the mother planet, being obviously Earth, uh, in around about the twenty first century. And what we did was we sent out these bots ahead of time to terraform a lot of these planets for us. Uh, and where we find ourselves is the year. What is it? Fifty five thousand. Um, uh, every game sort of starts at the same point. Uh, and at that point in time, I think humanity uh, has quite an, an expansive um, grip uh, on a lot of the galaxy. And a lot of those um, 
sort of glitter worlds uh, that exist in RimWorld are, are quite close to each other. And there are some systems which trade with each other or they might have sort of like a government or, or, or something along those lines. Um, but where we find ourselves is on a planet which has been colonised, but it's on the it's on the outer regions. Uh, so it's, it's really far out there and nobody sort of goes near it. Um, and we just got the short end of the stick, to be, to be honest yeah. with you. Um, and we're about to make it a lot shorter for ourselves. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so that's the whole idea is to get the fuck back off this planet, right? Because we don't want to be here. No one really wants to be here. And so um, we want to get out of this planet so we can travel to maybe something which is a, a little bit more pleasant to sort of live in. So that's... Uh... There's not much, but it's there. It's the, yeah. Well, it explains... I'm, I'm pausing because I'm reflecting on the things I've seen in the game and I go, yeah, that, that really kind of tees it up. You've got some people... You know, they're ranching, whatever. They're running their own little mm. colonies. They're doing their best. Crazy cannibals, whatnot, living around the place, raiding. But it's like all your quests are, are just... Maybe I'm wrong. Um, there could be a quest line that says, just live happily ever after. But it's <laughs> all about, like, get the fuck off this planet. Yeah, um, most of it is. Get get the... Like, get ascend the your off. mechanical gods. Get in a spaceship. Get out. Go. Just get off this planet. Whether it's make it to the palaces and the amazing as you say the glitter worlds with all their technology just just get out just anywhere else but where you've mm. crash landed anywhere else yeah. RimWorld is the game uh it makes me think of like your starcraft counter sheets where it's you counter this this unit with that unit um RimWorld is the game that has a counter for every move you make that's that's how it is everything you try and do whether you get murdered by horrendous horrors that burst out of your chest or murdered because the game sent 100 hedgehogs in your direction Mm, uh, that is a new one. The The whole bursting out of your chest thing, I haven't experienced that yet. I'm kind of excited a little bit to go in there and, and re-experience just that scenario because it's very aliens-driven, isn't it? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. They've, they've done really well, particularly with Anomaly. Um, not to say the others weren't done very well, but they didn't. They never needed, for example, multiple ways for a certain thing to play out. So I've, I've had mm. two versions of this chest burster thing. One is they've just burst out and you're fucked. Like, good luck. <laughs> um, and and like they literally like it. And it tells you how they infected everybody. So the game knows this is happening and works it out for you. So infected the partner while in bed together. Infected someone whilst performing surgery on them, while healing them from a battle. Um, and so it can spread to all sorts of people. And then another scenario had they talk about it and they say they've noticed someone here isn't what they seem. And you have to actually catch, imprison people and interrogate them to see if you can work it out. But you might miss it. And it's really disruptive oh. to take pawns that you need, imprison them, interrogate them, and then convince them to join again. That's a huge pain. Oh, yeah. Or you can perform explorative surgery. But, of course, who's going to perform explorative surgery on your doctor? Um, and, and so I, I managed to find it and, and get away with it the second time, which was cool. There's a real, like... There's different ways this can go. Like how you can still get the shamblers even if you don't do the monolith mm. um, and that sort of thing. But they've really, you could almost, I did think about it, you could almost recreate like the story of, it's a mix of um, like Alien and, um, what's the game, Dead Space? Especially with the monoliths. They're very much a Dead Space monolith if you've not played yeah. Dead Space. Oh no, I've played, I've played, yeah, I've, I've seen some shit. I've seen some shit in, in Dead Space. <laughs> Like, Death Stranding sounds better than RimWorld. Like, you've only got one sort of almost dead baby that you're carrying around with you. <laughs> uh, it's oh, like yeah, you it's started gonna... up a human farm to grow people to turn them into vampires so you could sell all their organs before they died, and then you eat them. Who does that in a video game? Mm. And it's like, I didn't start mm. out doing it. It just <laughs> it was, it's it's a scope, right? And I and wanted I, to raise horses yeah. because they've got lots of money, and now I run a people farm because they've got even more. Ah, <laughs> oh, jeez. It's like Ring people world. don't like it yeah. when you eat human flesh, but they'll still buy it from you. <laughs> yes, they that human leather. Uh, you, you can tell oh, a lot of that, mm. right? Yeah, sorry, I veer off a little bit because the memory just is flood back and I just go, ah, oh, fucking yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel like the the trauma trauma is a late game reward. 
Because if you die early game, it's mm. usually because something silly happened or you didn't realize the winters were that long where you were building and you've run out of wood and you can't you can't keep everyone fed and warm long enough to research geothermal power or or you're trying to do a snow playthrough and you built your house over a geothermal geyser. Uh, and now everyone gets too hot and gets heat stroke and dies. And you're like, but it's negative, <laughs> negative 15 degrees outside all the time. Yeah. I remember, yeah. I, I think I lasted a whole of an hour in one of my startups because there was a dry lightning storm, um, which wasn't <laughs> followed up by any, normally you have a dry lightning storm and then it rains and puts all the fire out for you. But um, we we didn't even have time to get everything off the ground and into the storehouse before the storehouse burnt to the ground. So I was like, okay, well, I mean, that's that's a restart. That's done. <laughs> I wanted to go back to Fallout uh, for a little bit. Um, yeah. I never played Fallout 1 or 2. I was straight into Fallout 3, um, just like yourself. Uh, that was in the days... Oh, YouTubers would have slowly to start have been a thing. And even though I was an early adopter of the internet and been gaming since MS-DOS and, and all the rest of it, I even I was still like, yeah, YouTube... Like, I love Star Wars, but that's kind of geeky. Like, what's up with mm. that? Mm. Um, and so I never really got into it for any sort of walkthrough or, or game recommendations. Um, so it would be, go to the shop, looks cool in the box, reads cool on the back of the box, I'm going to buy this game. Um fallout one and two they're they're top down games i believe uh the, both of them which were really interesting that they had if you have very low intelligence or, or no intelligence i think you actually just can't talk to people properly because your character's too <laughs> silly to do it and people are or, just like, or, what like, or what charisma you... maybe yeah yeah um i think that's something that gets discounted what i find as i make an effort to go back to older games is there's a level of sophistication that we expect from our character development and the traits we pick in game for newer games that a lot of people myself included naively just didn't expect from older games so i played doom one and i played commander keen they there was no version of of character development or, or picking your charisma or anything like that and then i start to realize like fallout one and two that's that's remarkably sophisticated or some of these games I see reviewed on YouTube that are older games where you go, it looks like a really basic first person shooter. But if you stop and actually read all the content, which almost no one ever did, the story in here is, is deep and it changes depending on what you're doing. And I think even in, even in Fallout 4, I was excited because it's such a standard mechanic that you've got dungeons around the world, caves and, and in Fallout, of course, it's, it's little raider groups and that sort of thing that they actually, the stuff you find in different areas changes depending on where your character's been to start with. Uh, I know there's that one in Fallout 4. Um, you've got a range of raiders and they're sort of aware of each other and they're kind of, they work together. And if you destroy one before going to the other, they actually talk about how that one was destroyed and they think you're coming here. And that sort of thing. And I, I love that interaction. The VATS system. It's a mix of either I kill everything in VATS or I never use VATS at all. And, and as much as I love it, there's been a little level of clunk to them. That clunk does exist in the Elder Scrolls games, but you shoot people a lot less in the Elder Scrolls games because it's all magic and swords. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about Vats? How do you feel about, like, a stop turn-based auto-aim? Well, what I have discovered while playing Battlefield is that I'm not a very good shot <laughs> in a game. I, I tend to think about my shot too much and then I hesitate and then I don't take it. And it's, it's really bad. So what I've discovered with the VAT system is it eliminates that uh, skill ceiling that I have. It gives me an equalizer and it sort of brings in the whole tactical RTS perspective of things. It's kind of like... Uh, what was the game? Um, Dragon Age. The the most recent Dragon Age as well also had like a time stoppy, um, you know, you can do it as an RTS kind of strategy thing if you're not that quick with it, for example. So for me, that's being able to slow the game down and go, all right, I need to prioritize you. I know that, uh, let's say, for example, it's, it's a bot or something like that. If I shoot their fusion core, it's going to detonate. I've got really high perception. My agility score is good, so I've got a, a good amount of VATs to actually utilize. Um, and, and it just sort of slows 
down the gameplay to me uh, to a point where I can sort of digest what is actually happening in the combat and not just sort of spawn die because my shot was uh, three yards away from where it actually needed to be. That still does happen occasionally in VATS, which is, you know, you have the randomizer a little bit. It's like, ah, oh, fuck, I had 95% chance to hit and I missed it. How did that even happen? That's that's rolling a critical fail for sure. Um <laughs> I, I agree with you. It's don't I use it whenever I play, and then I always feel kind of di- like I've eaten KFC. Seems like a good idea, and then I do it, and then I regret the decision, and I'll probably <laughs> do it again. Um, that's that's the vets system. But then at the same time, if I'm doing a stealth build in Skyrim, the amount of quick save, quick load I'm doing to get that pickpocket skill, of course I just can't be fucked with the just the dick around. Like, how are you supposed to be? How are you supposed to legitimately level your pickpocket skill and not just get absolutely destroyed unless you make it the first thing you do? It's like, I'm going to cheese the game. Like, if I'm in a permadeath run in, in RimWorld, the rage cage is Control-Alt-Delete. <laughs> you die, you, you still you don't want it to save. Yeah, no, and look, I, I think of uh, it as a resource, right? And it's like if I'm playing a game which involves magic. It's like playing Skyrim right? You've got your sword, you've got your bow, and you've also got magic as a resource, right? It's a pool. It doesn't matter what build you are. You've got a little bit of mana that you can use there. And by not using it, you're not utilizing a resource that you have available to yourself. So you're instantly playing with a handicap. And so by using vats, I feel like, you know, that's kind of like the magic, right? It's, 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 you've got that resource there. If you're not utilizing it, then you're sort of playing with a little bit of a handicap. And that's, that's sort of my take on, on it. Yeah. Hmm. No, I like that. That's uh, I like that thought. It's, it is there. I mean, that no one, you're doing a two-handed barbarian build in, in Skyrim. You're going to use the basic healing, whatever it is. Yeah. Heal, yep. heal lesser wounds, whatever they, they call it. No one's going to go, you know what? No magic. You might do a challenge like a Twitch streamer because we're all stupid. That's the sort of thing we do. No magic yep. challenge. Yeah. Uh, only using potions. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, it's been interesting actually playing Diablo 1, albeit briefly. You just can't do almost anything when you first start the game because you don't have any stats. It's like, hey, you found a staff of healing. You can't even put it in your hands because your magic skill's too low. But yeah. if you put your skills into magic, then you won't put it into strength and you might find a better sword. Nothing regenerates either in Diablo yeah. 1. I forgot, I forgot that used to be a thing. Your health doesn't regenerate. Your mana does not regenerate. You have to leave the map to get free healing of any kind. Oh. And I don't think you get free mana regeneration of any kind. Yeah, right. Uh, and that's interesting how much harder games used to be because it really has that I'm an, a video game tabletop vibe. Hmm. It's not like, yeah, we, we know this is a video game. We know how gamers game. Everyone's got a little bit of health regen. Everyone's got a little bit of mana regen all the time, no matter what. You've got a few basics. Here's what you can do. It's like, no, nah, you got to build this character. And the enemies don't respawn. You can't grind your level. You can only go into constantly harder and harder places. Hope for the best. Yeah. And then, yeah. of course, I died and I hadn't saved my game. Oh. And if you don't save your game and you die, it's like done. It's Everything is permadeath. Permadeath is normal. Per- permadeath is how video games used to work. And you go, Yeah. that is how they used to work. Like arcade yeah. games, everything. Doom, Duke Nukem, all of them. But you just, you just died. That was it. If you didn't save your game, you just died. There's no, you respawned in town and off you go. Maybe, maybe go and collect your stuff again. Like it's yeah. satisfactory. Let's yeah. just save the middleman. I think it just makes it more accessible to people though. When, and that's that's sort of the, the idea of... Um, in now in in modern day in modern game gaming is to make it more accessible to more people and so you'll you know you'll sell greater volumes as a result of that it's all a sales pitch really at the end of the day so and that that makes sense yeah. you can make it well games that you love if someone's making it unaccessible to themselves you you, you want to watch um, yeah like if I'm doing a permadeath run on RimWorld I'm going to get more views than a non permadeath run because the stakes are that much higher that yeah you know my little dude's going to get his head cut off total war you're a Warhammer fan, uh, mm-hmm. both 40k and fantasy, I believe. Yep, yep. And Total War have both a 40k and a fantasy edition. Is that correct? No, not quite. So they've come out with the 40. Uh, sorry, the the Warhammer um, edition. 40k is rumored to be uh, the next big Total War game. So okay. that is a 
apparently what they're working on now, uh, the the leaks, uh, the sources they're coming from are, are, are fairly big in the industry. So I would suggest they're fairly creditable. Um, I'm very excited if they are true because, uh, you know, it, it, it's really combining two very big passions of mine. But um, yeah, Warhammer, War, Total War Warhammer, one, two, and three. I, I, I've played all three of them and it has been an absolute pitfall of time for me <laughs> i love it um i yeah yeah where geez where do you want to start is it all about moving just your units around is there some uh, a level of city building or, or town upgrading involved yeah absolutely there where is do you so, start as a new player so you pick as a, I'll, I'll probably go and buy the game after this let's face it where okay. do you start as a new player well, well it's i would say it's it's harder to start as a new player now. And the reason being is Total War Warhammer 3, as it stands right now, is the combination of three separate Total War games. So you have Total War Warhammer 1, then 2, and then 3. And they always said it was going to be a trilogy. Um, now, each game itself has its individual uh, primary game mode. Um, so for Total War Warhammer 2, it was the Vortex campaign. Uh, and then for 3, we've got the, the Realms of Chaos. Um, but then they ha- in Total War Warhammer 2 and 3, they also had this uh, Mortal Empires and now Immortal Empires, which is the combination of all three games, all the factions that have been released for all three games, put into, uh, in its current format, Immortal Empires, uh, the entirety of the total war, or sorry, the, the entirety of the Warhammer map uh, in its in its its existence. So if you go and look at a Warhammer uh, from Games Workshop map, that is the map that you're actually playing on. So the scope of the game is enormous. There's well over 300 settlements scattered across the entirety of the map. Uh, and it's your job to, I mean, you, you've got one of three victory conditions. You can either go for your short campaign victory, which might be to go and beat up your neighbors and take their territory. Um, or you could go for a longer campaign victory, which might take you from uh, what is essentially Cathay, which is the most eastern part of the map, all the way over to Lustria, uh, which is in your westernmost part of the map, uh, and to dominate somebody over there, for example. And then you have your total dominance campaign, which basically is a map painter, uh, and you've just got to go around painting the entirety of the map, which is probably two to 300 hours in a campaign just to do that. So it's, it's quite expensive. When you, when you say painting the map, you mean killing everyone and taking everything for your own? Yeah, 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 you you no. you changing changing the map to be just your faction color. So, yeah, you start Excellent. off with just just one little tiny region, one little dot on the map, and you you want to expand that and just take over the entire world world dominance. Yeah, um, as a new player, where a lot of people start is they do buy into that Total War Warhammer three. And you can actually experience the Immortal Empires, that grand scale map um, as the base game. You'll have access to the base races that are available in Total War Warhammer 3. You will see the other races and all of their units and everything like that. You'll even fight against them as well. But you won't be able to use them yourself unless you have brought Total War Warhammer 1 and Total War Warhammer 2 as well. Gotcha. And the game, Steam like automatically... <clears throat> Yeah, that's and I, I was a big fan of. You got to, you can see the others, but you can't play as them unless you go buy the other games. That's exactly right. And there's multiple, multiple, multiple DLCs uh, for each one of those games as well. Total War Warhammer One had a fairly long tail. Warhammer Two had a massive tail, um, and was probably in Total War Warhammer Three was probably in a production for a little bit too long. But there was just so much DLC available to that. Uh, and where I think what we in this. In Total War Warhammer 3, we had uh, the Chaos update come out uh, as the first DLC. We then had... We had four. Yeah, we're up to four DLCs. I'm just trying to count them out in my head. We've just got the Chaos Dwarves, which are a whole new faction. Um, Then we had uh, a very controversial DLC. uh, And then we've got the most recent one, which is Thrones of Decay as well. So, which has sort of hit the mark. It's brought a lot of people back to Total War, which is awesome to see. What was controversial about the DLC? It's such a such a nerdy thing for us to say. It was a very controversial split. The community. yeah, it, it well didn't split the community. It turned the community against um, Total War and oh, Creative okay. Assembly as a whole. And it's really been that uh, price gouging point that we're currently mm. experiencing. It's been 
how much value do I get for my dollar putting into the game? And the value that or the amount that they increased the price for the DLCs to was quite high as it really eliminated a lot of people from being able to purchase it and buy into it. Um, but then even the amount of content that they had um, – in, in the DLC itself was quite lacking in comparison to what they had for a number of the other DLCs, even for Total Warhammer 2 and Warhammer 1. It's like, we well, are asking for literally twice the price of what I paid for for the, a DLC in Total War Warhammer 2, and you're actually giving me less than what I was getting for that as well. So the value proposition just wasn't there, unfortunately, and people called them out on it, uh, and... You yeah, know, fair enough too. I mean, yeah, it's your game. You can do whatever you want, but if you expect me to like it, that's that's up to me. Yeah, Ob- yeah. Oblivion horse armor is is what it sounds like. Yeah, and, and look, there's been a big walk back from Creative Assembly recently. So they actually came out and and look, um, Sega have really put them to the hammer. They've they've axed. Uh, probably 70% of their workforce at this point in time due to underperformance. So they they had to hit the mark with the current DLC, uh, with Thrones of Decay. And um, thankfully they have, and they've, they've really fixed a lot of those value proposition problems that they had in the past. They did have to come out and fix the last DLC, so they had to release brand new units uh, to everybody who had purchased the DLC um, as a, as a post um, sort of fix. It's like, yeah, look, we agree with you. There wasn't enough content for the price point that we were asking for. And here's some more extra units for you. We, we apologize. We're going to do better. Uh, and they, the meme was that Thrones of Decay was Thrones of Delay because they had to continuously delay it because of the layoffs. Um, and then they really wanted to make sure that it was 100% polished um, before it came out. And the reception's been great. So, you know, we've gone from three to 5,000 concurrent players in Total Warhammer 3, and at its peak, it's sort of hit around about the 72,000 uh, with Thrones yeah, of Decay. Wow. So awesome. it's 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 been really, really good. Uh, and, look, I hope that they continue with it. So, yeah. That's very cool. Have you ever done the 40K uh, RimWorld uh, mods? No, I haven't. No. I have no, seen they look quite impressive, but Do then they? I also think it would be either not very law friendly or if it is law friendly to the 40k universe it would just be too easy yeah I, unless I think... your enemies become tyranids i feel like like <laughs> the, the, the gas guzzlers are coming in for a raid and you've just turned up with space marines and absolutely torn them to pieces yeah yeah and, and i i do like my uh games workshop games to be very similar to law they need to be law friendly otherwise i can't really get mm. into um the game itself it's like if i'm going to boot up fallout 4 for example and i'm going to install 10 billion mods i'm going to make sure that those mods are as close to law friendly as possible i don't want to be rolling in there with an ak or uh or, or whatever it might be yeah 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 no, i know what you mean I'm, I'm very similar there are times where i'll go for a laugh let's download like a unicorn <laughs> yeah, there is a, uh, a skyrim mod i remember seeing it turns all the enemies into thomas the tank engine oh yes um yeah <laughs> um but yeah for me it's mostly quality of life better sounds better yeah. weather better textures i mean there was some in skyrim that i do understand because the game itself was almost not law friendly that you get like artifacts of, of eldritch power literally from the gods they they personally give them to you and you're like sweet in five levels from now i'm going to find a dagger that does more damage than this ebony longsword given to me by the whatever i, I um, mean they just all ended up in in on, on a wall uh being displayed um yeah right because you went yeah. and just made your own sword and it was better yeah absolutely you did what were some of the first games you ever played i was maybe in prep or grade one um and we just moved into a house and uh dad brought home uh, an original nintendo and that was sort of my first experience with playing games i i don't have a great deal of memory as to what games were being played though i remember at that age i was just doing a lot of watching um and it was you know mum was very strict in terms of what i was and what i was allowed to watch um and probably for good reason as well but um geez she saw mortal Kombat in the teenage years she lost her right? <laughs> so, um there was the if if you're not desensitized to video games, like if you've got no concept of them, even like the PlayStation 1 Mortal Kombat's were horrendous. The first game I actually remember playing and getting really, really angry with 
would have been Battletoads. I remember playing a lot of Battletoads. And I remember going down this tunnel and you were sort of swinging off this rope uh, and you had to like kick the wall because the enemies were coming out of them and that sort of stuff and avoid, uh, you know, a bunch of traps as you were sort of going down. And it was very rare for me to sort of get <laughs> to the actual bottom of it. Um, but yeah, I have a, for some reason that memory in my youth is the thing that sort of springs to front of mind and goes, this is the game that you played when you were a child. And I know I didn't play it that much, um, but maybe it just scarred me the most because I died so many times trying to get down this hole. Oh, yeah. What's your favorite conspiracy theory? What's the best bit of silliness you've ever come across that other people are taking seriously? Unless you take it seriously, which you're allowed to if you share. Mm. Mm. You see, I find myself to be quite... I, I like to think that I'm quite grounded um, and I, I can't really think of any conspiracy theories that I'm bringing off the top of my head that I sort of believe in, uh, unless I believe in them so much that, uh, you know, in my perception, it's not a conspiracy uh, and, and it is actually mm-hmm. uh, law, but... Uh, uh, like ghosts. You say you'd like, most well, people have some kind of opinion on ghosts yeah, one way or the other. But yeah. Even people that don't believe in ghosts don't consider ghosts a conspiracy theory. Mm. Yeah, it's like aliens, right? I mean, people who don't believe in aliens, I, I feel like that's just a little bit silly, knowing how large the universe is and the galaxies are and, um, you know, the, the the amount of other opportunities that there are for intelligent life is just, uh, it's mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing when you really sit there and think about it. Um, but... As far as ghosts are concerned, I have an interesting experience with that. And for the largest time growing up in a very Christian house, um, you know, mum was always, oh, they don't exist and blah, 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 and their spirits and whatever she wanted to tell me. Um, but we, I, I left home fairly early and, and lived, on my, lived on my own or with my brother. And I remember we were living in an old monastery which had been converted into a set of units. Uh, it was really, really cool. So we were living in the actual chapel itself, so the, 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 the literal church, and they had split it into three levels. And the very top level, you know, was like the master bathroom, which had a spa and all this sort of stuff. And uh, it was very, very fancy. But it was probably in my maybe early 20s, maybe it was 20 or maybe 19 at the time, and... We were on the Terps, you know, have, having a good time, as, as you do at that age. And on the Terps. On the most Terps. Most Australian thing said ever in a podcast. <laughs> um, anyway, look, I, for some reason, I think I had to work in the morning. So I had gone to bed uh, at, at a reasonable hour. It was around about 10 o'clock at night or maybe 10.30 or something like that after having a few. Um, and there was a lot of cats in the house. Um, because my sister was living with us as well. And she had like three cats between her and my brother. I'm not a cat person. I don't have cats. I know that you are and I apologize, but I'm highly allergic to them. So me, I'm allergic to grass right now. Okay. Any, any planet that doesn't support life. I'm, I'm all for. (laughs) Okay. Um, so yeah, gone to bed and, uh, it was probably maybe one o'clock in the morning and you know how like, and you would probably appreciate this when your cat comes and sits on the end of the bed and it sort of pulls down the the sheets right around your feet and you can't move them. And, and I was having that experience and I'm like in a semi-conscious state, fucking kicking my legs, just oh, God damn, there's a bloody cat on the end of my bed. They don't like me. Why the hell would there be a cat on the end of my bed? Why would they even come in here? They know not to come near me. And I wake up and I see just somebody just, just staring at me uh, from the end of the bed. And there was, there was literally something there and I couldn't move my feet because, uh, you know, I was a semi, a semi-conscious state, sort of half asleep uh, and a little bit still drunk as well. But I woke up in a panic really quickly, not being able to, to move my feet or anything along those lines. And I saw somebody there looking at me. And I swear to this day, somebody was looking at me sitting on the end of my bed in an old church of all places. And I was, this is freaking freaky. The next day, go to work. Everything is all sweet. It's all peachy keen. And I get home and dad comes over. I'm like, hey, man, what's what's going on? What's what's news? And he's like, look, I just wanted to let you know that your great-grandma passed away last night. 
Uh, and I was like, yeah, you fucking proper, what? Proper doppelganger. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I was, I was just, I was just thrown. Uh, and to this day, like, I, I still think that it was her, um, mm -hmm. you know, coming to say her goodbyes to everybody. And she just happened to be sitting on the end of my bed and, and, you know, yeah. Yeah. Wow. I just, every time I think about it, it gives me goosebumps and I just go, well, that's, it was definitely an experience and it's mm. left me, um, it's left me definitely open-minded and I wouldn't sit there and run around and advocate that, oh, go surreal, you know, knock on everyone's door, the, the end you, times are coming. You're open to a possibility. Yeah. I, I, well, after that experience, you know, I, I would have dismissed anybody as if they were a lunatic, right? But after that experience, I was sort of like, I go, okay, well, no, I get it now. That's That was that was definitely a thing. And it threw me for a, a good while. And, um, yeah, yeah, so that's – that's uh, yeah, that's definitely not a conspiracy theory. Uh, well, I don't think no, it is. But it's an uh, awesome story, though. Yeah, isn't it? It was Here's me like dreaming up questions to ask in a podcast. I'm like, I wonder if anyone's got any cool stories. That was spot on. Yeah. Great, eh? Excellent. Wow. If there was a game that you could forget, entirely forget, like just make a choice, just go delete out of my brain mm -hmm. so I can play it again, what would mm -hmm. that game be? Okay. Oh, do you want me to delete it as in it was like a good experience and I want to experience it again? Yeah, yeah. Like for me, it's Subnautica. It was it was so much more of a better game than I was expecting in regards to its atmosphere to just be able to forget that game and jump back in again. Or like, wow, this is awesome. I'd love to do that again. Oh, jeez. What's the game just made you go, this is fucking great. I want to um, be surprised by how good this game is again. It would have to be the Dawn of War series. Yeah, one, yeah? specifically Dawn of War 1 and 2. Um, Dawn of War 3 you can go jump off a cliff that's fine um, they really screwed the is that Dark Crusade or the one before the Dark Crusade uh, just Dawn of War 3 in general it, it, yeah they, I mean they cancelled all most of everything after they released that game um, but yeah Dawn of War 1 and Dawn of War 2 sorry I'm with you yeah I was thinking of all the expansions to Dawn of War 1 when you said yeah. Dawn of War 3 yeah yeah, yeah, got it. yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, Soulstorm was probably one of my favourite DLCs mm -hmm. for Dawn of War 1 I remember playing that a lot and Winter Assault as well um, mm -hmm. and that that's interesting because that uh, sort of feeds into that grand strategy uh, perspective mm -hmm. that I really enjoy from my it Total War games it was giving it a red hot try it with was. elements from the tabletop you, you used to, I mean I was playing that again recently I think people, the modern community goes really hard on that to try and take that game and, and sort of bring it to the grander scale so you can have units the right size and that sort of thing. But yeah. parking your units in terrain and that sort of thing. I think the base building, as much as I love the games, don't get me wrong, left it. There was no other benchmark, really, that I can think of that said, we're taking this kind of game, we're trying to make it real. But if someone says, I'm taking the, the Warhammer 40k tabletop game and making... A, a like for like animated version for a video game i'm yeah. fucking yeah i'm in that's awesome yeah yeah uh, and then total war uh sorry uh, dawn of war 2 chaos rising mm -hmm. the, just having fun corrupting your squad of chaos marines uh and slowly turning them into to chaos warriors over the course of the campaign and seeing you know which ones left you how far could you push them before they were like you are totally corrupted i'm gonna fucking purge your ass um uh, it was it was it was a great experience. I loved. It. Yeah, I I I've, I dropped quite a few hours in that. Hey, this has been fucking cool chatting with you. Well, thank you're, you. You're really into video games in a level I didn't I didn't expect, and that's fucking great. Um, that makes me really happy. I'm I'm here to please, I guess. <laughs> that's cool, buddy. This has been absolutely excellent. Thanks so much for coming to episode two of Law Stories. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's a real honor to be here and uh, I look forward to, uh, to catching, you, catching your streams and, and seeing you play.